For those who came in after the welcome and for those watching this sermon on YouTube, I begin with a trigger warning that this sermon contains references to sexual assault and rape, so take care of yourselves accordingly. About today's message, three things. There's a way an event gets officially recorded, written down, reported. And there's the way we talk about that event, weaving together what we know of context and history, and of course, our own personal experience with that canonized account. And third, there's the event itself, how it actually took place in the eyes of those involved. So what can we learn from these three? And what word might God have for us in the midst of it all? Hmm? That's what we're exploring today. And so as we prepare for the word preached, would you join with me, your hearts and minds, in prayer? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Bathsheba. Bathsheba. What do you think of when you hear her name? Hmm? I'll admit, She's always been portrayed as a seductress, as a sexy temptress, and so I'll admit that I'm biased when it comes to Bathsheba, because I live in a world that portrays her as one thing, a harlot, up there on her roof, doing a striptease for David, luring him, taunting him, teasing him, just asking for it. But if we go back and read the account, that's not what it says she's doing at all. She was purifying herself after her period. She's completing a ritual. She's taking a bath. She is, according to the law, unclean. And she must make herself clean again in order to re-enter society. You see, when she's on her period and in the days after, She's not allowed to touch people or things even during that time. Now, Bathsheba is doing what she's supposed to be doing. Well, well, I hear people say, but, but she's up there on that roof. She knows, she knows King David can see her from his place. She knows she did that on purpose. She went up there on purpose to tempt him. Well, hmm, I don't think that assumption really adds up. See, if we turn back a few chapters in 2 Samuel, we see that King David has declared war and he's launching attack after attack after attack leading his troops, but then, but then, in the spring of the year, recorded for us in chapter 11, which Allison read, David sends Joab in his place to lead the siege against the Ammonites. And in a time when kings go off to war, King David didn't do that. 
He stayed home and took a nap on his couch instead. See, friends, something's fishy here. When people say, well, she asked for it. It's just not true. King David is supposed to be at war, not up on his roof, where he can see his other neighbor's rooftops. Do you think that this woman would have chosen to complete her purification ritual in full view of a man, a man who was not her husband, if she would have known that he was there and risked penalty, the penalty that comes with contact with other people while unclean, would she have risked that if she would have known he was there? Now see, when I ask the question like this, it changes our perspective, doesn't it? The account goes on to report that David, quote, sent someone to inquire about the woman, and that after finding out that she is the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah, after finding out that she belongs to someone, literally belongs to someone else, because women were property in those days, the account states it goes on that David sent messengers to get her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now, that's what the official account says. And the way that we tend to talk about this official account is that David and Bathsheba committed adultery. In fact, the title that is inserted into my New Revised Standard Version of the Bible by its editors says right there, above chapter 11, David commits adultery with Bathsheba. See, there's the way an event gets officially reported she was purifying herself. He sent messengers to get her. She came and he lay with her. And there's the way an event gets talked about by us. She was a seductress. She tempted him. They had an affair. And there's the way an event really took place. And now, friends, I wasn't there, obviously. So I don't know for sure. But I do know this. You are not allowed to say no to the king. Let me say that again. You're not allowed to say no to the king. King David saw her when he should not have seen her. He saw her naked, and he wanted her. And he sent messengers. I wonder what those messengers were like. Messengers in the service of the king? Were they guards? Did he send guards to get her? And what do you do when you are asked or told or ordered by someone more powerful than you to do something you do not want to do or ought not do or should not do? What do you do? Do you risk defying authority? Do you risk the consequences of challenging authority. A friend and I were talking
talking about this text this week. And she said, well, you can't say no to the king. Oh, and I cringed. I cringed because see, you see now, don't you, that it matters. It matters how we talk about an event. Saying you can't say no to the king implies that someone who is vulnerable has some kind of power in a confrontation with someone who is in authority. And in exercising of that power, because we always have power, but we must remember that an exercising of that power will come with consequences, grave consequences. Because you're not allowed to say no to the king. And so perhaps Bathsheba went willingly, but she did not give her consent. In a situation in which a person is not allowed to say no, you see, when we read that the king sent guards to get her and he lay with her, then we can and we should read, friends, that that means that King David raped Bathsheba. Because you can't give consent when you're not allowed to do so. The story goes on. David tries to cover his tracks by sending for Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, to come home. Come home, Uriah. Let's talk about war. And then I tell you what, buddy, go and have a conjugal visit with your wife. But Uriah doesn't do that. And so David sends him to the front lines to be killed. And he is. And the story becomes messier and messier. And in the midst of the mess, Bathsheba is only allowed to speak once. She gets one line. I am pregnant, she says. And with that one line, she speaks to us. See what happened to me, she says. See? And yet when David gets called out for his sin by Nathan, his sins of his royal abuse of power, when he gets called out, yes, by Nathan for these sins, his sins are only named as killing Uriah and taking Bathsheba as his wife. That's it. And this makes me angry. This makes me angry on behalf of Bathsheba and on behalf of every woman who has ever been Bathsheba. It makes me angry on behalf of every woman whose sexual assault went unrecognized and unseen and unbelieved. Why do we fail to name this as sin? This assault on Bathsheba is set amidst the larger structure of patriarchy and the larger structure of misogyny. And perhaps that's why we fail to see it and name it as such. Because when we are part of a structural system of sin, and it's all you've ever known, and it's all you've ever been taught, and your official accounts are written from that perspective, and you talk about those events from that perspective, it takes a paradigm shift 
of epic proportions to resurrect us from the grave that we've all been lying in all along and did not even know it. And so I say to Bathsheba, and I say to all of the Bathshebas of the world today, that even in the midst of these structures, these structural systems of sin, of patriarchy and misogyny, I say to you, Bathshebas, do not doubt the power of your voice. Keep speaking. I see you. Keep speaking. I hear you. Keep speaking. I believe you. Keep speaking because God is with you. Keep speaking because Christ is crucified with you in that moment. Keep speaking because Jesus loves you. And keep speaking because that love is stronger than any sin that this world has used against you. And keep speaking because you will rise again. And keep speaking. And may the words of your mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in God's sight, for our rock has come to redeem these structures of sin that seem unredeemable. Keep speaking. Amen.